MWC 2017 is officially closed. We're all uninstalling the companion app from our phones and trying to reacclimate to our home time zones. Thankfully, we have a ton of cool new gear to talk about, and we're going to blitz down the highlights of this year's Mobile World Congress, the winners, the losers, the WTFs. So make sure you're charged and ready for episode 242 of the Pocket Now Weekly. Well, this weekly podcast is where we dissect and discuss those gadgets that make our lives mobile, smartphones, tablets, and wearables. It's all the stuff you wished existed when you were a kid, and tech stuff used to use more letters and numbers than 5 and G. It's now like a bad episode of Sesame Street up in here. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, senior editor at PocketNow.com, blasting the signal from a gorgeous morning in Southern California, joined this week by the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Anabong Edda from Board at Work. How are you on this fine March day? Thank you for having me. I, I am doing well. It looks sunny outside, but this is new, uh, not New England, but this is actually the <laughs> Northeast in New York, and it is deceptive. <laughs> As always. And of course, uh, plucky podcast producer Mr. Jules Wong will be trying to keep this whole ship afloat. How's it going out there, buddy boy? I wish I had more of a ship to float. <laughs> Yes, this week will be a bit experimental for how we uh, how we uh, compartmentalize the YouTube broadcast from the from the audio version of the show. Uh, we are in a state of transition. We're going to try and figure out our tech issues to get a higher quality product up for both the viewers and the listeners. But before we jump into tech tomfoolery, Mr. Wong, would you be so kind as to explain how people might get in touch with us for the show? As in the short term, that's going to be changing a little yeah. bit. Yeah, so no YouTube live for the time being, and no Twitter as well. So the best way that you might want to address us is through our email. Uh, you want to ask questions, you want to take some time in doing so, then head over to your email client and mail us at podcast at pocketnow.com. Took me a while to remember that. And a whole bunch of, of <laughs> other uh, padding words had to help me out there. But that sounds fine. Podcast at Puckanow.com. And you still can reach out to us on Twitter using the hashtag PN Weekly. It's just going to be that kind of time delay as, uh, as we're sorting these issues out. So we will get to any questions that you guys send our way there. It's just... Uh, Unfortunately, it won't be a part of the live broadcast. Now, I, I think we need to jump directly into cool news and announcements and reactions and all that fun stuff. Uh, now, uh, now, Anabong, you sent Lex over for uh, for MWC this year. You you weren't on the ground covering it yourself. Uh, is it, is it uh, is it because you're too old? Is it your your feeble health and you weren't able to uh, to make the plane ride this year? Is that that's that? What, 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 what are you talking about? My <laughs> feeble health. Lex was Lex was doing his impersonation of you and your gimp leg. He was like, "Oh no, I'm I'm Edabong. I can't sit on an well, airplane." Well, he, he didn't have the pimp cane, so it wasn't a good impression. <laughs> uh, no, we uh, it was kind of last minute, and we needed to send someone. And um, well, basically, I was waiting to receive the G6 here, and somebody had to go last minute, so Lex <laughs> drew the straw for that. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, it was uh, it was interesting. He gave me some uh, insights, a few things that he saw, and also what I saw from you know you guys and everyone else at the show right on well i got to meet up with him i mean it, it, what's hilarious is i think this was the first time i actually got to, to meet up with him face to face in barcelona and and uh, i know he went through a couple uh just little mini trials out there on the on the floor and i like i think you need to hold on to that kid because he uh he covered that show with a lot of heart considering the issues that he was having Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. I, I told him, you know, it was still good coverage, no matter how how much turbulence he experienced, you, you know, know, through the I whole mean, process. Like, we, every time you, you travel, you've got cameras, you've got computers, you've got microphones, you're trying to do the best job that you can. And I like, your channel's a lot like ours, where we're trying to cover this as efficiently as possible, but... You know, we run a pretty lean team here at Pocket now, and Lex was describing like he was having camera problems, he was having some some notebook issues, and I don't know that I've ever seen a guy like describe the kind of problems he was having and still have that kind of a positive attitude towards like, yep, yeah, well, I'm just gonna keep shooting, we're gonna get it done. You know, it wasn't any of this like drama or like you know shenanigans or anything. It was it was like, uh, well, they threw me a curveball. I'm still gonna roll with it. So <laughs> I I, I want to let you know that if you ever let him go, we might try and steal him from you. 
Not happy. I liked I liked that that can do <laughs> attitude. <laughs> well, well, I'll, I'll let Lex know that you uh, you publicly praised him on. Talking <laughs> Network, he so. is a wanted entity at this point. So uh, <laughs> yeah. hot stuff, hot stuff. Not not and and hopefully that doesn't impact you if he's trying to like renegotiate a contract with you guys. Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, sorry, but but again, it was it was it was great getting to meet him in person, and then also just like. Man, this I I really like that kid's spirit. That that was a great attitude that he had. Yeah. So uh, so it was good. But you know, getting uh, getting away from the inside baseball track on how we cover our shows, uh, Jaime and I were stomping around Barcelona trying to cover as many of the pre briefs, the the meetings that we have before the show, and then some videos from the actual show floor proper. I I we have a list, a, a rundown of the uh, the gadgets that I think were sort of the highlights of the show. Obviously, we didn't have some of the heavier players there announcing phones like Samsung. We got a tease on what's coming down the pipe and uh HTC released a little early sort of in some markets with an incomplete product on the HTC U so they were something of a no show uh for MWC but I wanted to kick things off starting uh with something a little bit more entry mid-level range a phone that I think has been getting mostly positive reactions from people looking at the Moto G5 um, an update to the G series line, bringing uh, bringing a I think a nicer build quality to that mid range price point. And uh, Anabong, I was I was curious to get your thoughts because we've been talking a lot about uh, last year we were talking a lot about phones at the four hundred dollar price point, and now I think for twenty seventeen some of the exciting conversation is now pushing down into the three and sub three hundred dollar price point. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. I think. Um... Motorola has an opportunity here and Lenovo has an opportunity to win that market. Um, right now, I honestly would say that Blue owns the sub $200 market. You know, they have so many mm -hmm. products here. And right. I believe with the G5 and the G5 Plus, you're looking at sub 200 and then slightly above $200 for the price yeah. them for, for these devices. Um, I think I think there's, a, there's an opportunity here for Motorola to really just take over that price range and say, hey, you got 200 bucks, here's an awesome phone for you. And right. with the G5, I liked what I saw except for one thing. Uh, again, Motorola, uh, please put the fingerprint <laughs> sensor where that Moto logo is at the back. It, it, just, it just calls for it. I get it with that button because for, for me, it just takes it away a little bit. I, you know, visually and aesthetically, it kind of takes it away. But from what I saw with the with the G5, I know our video is not up yet on our channel. But um, from what I saw from the device, I thought it was a solid offering. It all depends on what Motorola does in terms of marketing. Because, you know, the thing about devices like that is you kind of have to push in some form. You don't have to do traditional TV ads for these. These right. are the kind of things you need to do uh, smart targeted ads, whether it's online, promotions, um, you know, influencers, those kind of things that you can exactly. actually push the device like this. So I, hopefully they can do that with the, the Moto G5. I liked what I saw is just, you know, is Lenovo ready to claim a stake in one segment of the market? Totally. Quick rundown on those specs. We've got the uh, the five inch full HD uh, display. Uh, we're looking at the Qualcomm six two five, which is I think going to be a an amazing performer for this year for twenty seventeen. I think it's going to be the mid ranger chip for twenty seventeen. Oh, definitely. Basically. Yeah. And uh, uh, to your point about the fingerprint sensor being in the back, like they they removed the dimple that the you know the Moto I know Bentley that is gone was like. That would have been a better optimal uh, implementation, if anything at all, for the back. But instead, you know, Lenovo has its own ways. It's been doing its uh, things in the front, its sensors in the front with, some, with the Moto Z. And there was that also, um, the G, did the G4 also do the stupid um, square shape? Uh, for yeah, the... so, yeah, the G4 <laughs> not only had the fingerprint sensor on the front, but it, it was like the, uh, it was like the Moto Z, and exactly, where it that wasn't, wasn't a, a home button. button. Uh, yeah jesus now a, a couple a couple of interesting points here one in the united states it looks like we're only going to get the g5 plus this year so we're going to be starting at that i think it's the 229, 229. Uh, price yeah. point um and that that i think is for the two gigabyte of ram model so i think interesting in there when we're talking about mid-range players this really looks like it's targeted right up against the huawei uh the whole huawei 6x 
Like those two seem like they were designed in a laboratory to be nemesis yeah. for each other. Um, what do you what do you think about this price point um, lacking NFC? You know, we've got an entry level handset. I mean, for a first world country, I think the two twenty nine price point is about as entry level as people will take seriously here in North America. Uh, with um, mobile payments starting to finally gain a little traction here in the U.S., do you think that that's going to be a deal breaker? for people who might want to look at that kind of uh, mobile banking solution? Not this year. Um, I, I don't think it will be. I think come 2018, yeah, sure, that would be a problem. But my own thing is, is NFC chip that much more expensive? I, I, I don't get it. I, I, I don't understand. I don't understand. Yeah, but to me, it's just kind of this, it's a slightly weird that um, you, know, you have that price difference there. But I think in general, most people this year will not have an issue with it. I think when you buy the phone and next year you want to use Android Pay or you know something like that, then you go, ooh, I can't use it with this phone. That's when that's right. going to arise. So, but I think, I think this year will be fine. You know, speaking of bank, I've been looking at the Moto G series for quite a while now. And uh, it started off with uh, back in 13, I think. Uh, it was the original Moto G with the Snapdragon 400 series mm -hmm. and just like very base specs. And especially because we were sort of still in that kind of, you know, infancy for the mid ranger um, smartphone. It was kind of struggling. Uh, but what we saw was a $180 price tag, which is a $50 split from what we have then from now and mm -hmm. it became motorola's best-selling uh smartphone ever so yeah does you know with the market changing up with more players and uh heavily it's it seems like everything has been driven up um the prices have been driven up and the spec wars have been driven up for this sector and i think i think we're leaving behind some people and well i, th I, I don't think, think we I should think it's ever important leave behind to people in this market no, I, I completely agree, but I think it's important to note that this this is one of the confusing aspects of a phone like the G, where the G doesn't represent one phone anymore. Like last year, we saw a spectrum of G phones, right? You know, there were, there were four distinct different models that I think uh, were designed for very different markets within a, about a $100 price price spread of these can, so can I, other can, other markets Asus. around the world Asus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit a little bit like i think moto is drawing that inspiration from a couple of other manufacturers but i think it's important to note that some regions will only be getting the 625 some regions will be getting the g5 not the g5 plus which is going to have a 400 series qualcomm processor and some regions will have access to both depending on what people want to buy so i think once we get to that 200 dollar price point where i think the the, the Qualcomm 400 series powered phone is going to land at the $20 premium. We've got a nicer build construction. We've got a larger battery for a G series and entry level G series at that point. I think they've got a good spread when we're talking about a difference of $20 US versus like the original Moto G with like, you know, a Qualcomm 400 series processor there. It, it, it's, it's not I, I don't think we've left too many people. And at that point, you can then start looking at some of the the ultra low cost options sub. Um, we, we played with an Alcatel that I think is going to satisfy some of that market where you don't even have a 720p display. Um, I don't know. Enabong, do you think that Moto's strategy is is improving the premium experience for the entry level or do you think too many people are going to get left behind? I, I kind of agree a little bit with Jules. No, I don't think too many, but I think some people. I really think companies should really just, or everyone should copy BMW models of 357 and be done. Uh, that's right. just me. Um, because one of the things that, you know, that always happens, especially with the G line, is that, yes, it starts at 229, but it's 2 gigs of RAM. Then there's a 4 gig version. There's a 3 gig of RAM version. Which <laughs> right. th those are the kind of things that I think a lot of people who are buying in that market would like to find the best... Uh, for the price right. that fits. And I think if Moto were to come in and say, here is a Moto G with three gigs of RAM, you don't have to go to four, but three is, is a nice couple medium. And here's it for 229, boom, done, nothing else. Maybe you may do two different sizes if you want to, but even right. with the sizes as five and 5.2, to me is negligible at that point. You just come up with one size. Now it wasn't a five to 5.5, where I would say there's a huge difference. So. I, w I would rather them have a singular device that can crush in that market than have 
a singular series that has multiple devices that competes because you know to me it's you why we has one and then why right. we also have an honor that would be one Right. And then, then you have uh, Blue, who has multiple, and Blue's known for that. And they, they do fine with all their, you know, 10 different types of devices that they throw <laughs> out. But that's their market. So as somebody like Motorola and Lenovo, you want to come in and you want to almost set a standard for this market so that everybody is coming, you know, is basically catching up to you. And hopefully they can do that, but I just don't like the... I don't like the sizing, and I don't like just this, just little skew changes in there for me. Right. Well, yeah. and I, I think the nice thing is, uh, one of the things that I, I think is worth mentioning about this phone, Lenovo Moto still has a great inroads in the United States for selling to customers. I think they're probably one of the more successful companies at transitioning out of the traditional market into Moto Maker and getting people to buy directly. And it comes with one of the, uh, I, I, I think for this price point, it comes with that peace of mind that it kind of doesn't matter what carrier you're on, that at launch, this will have full support for all four major carriers in the United States. So I think there's a little lately. benefit there. What's that? They've been getting into that lately. I, I'm not sure in terms of the Moto Z, like it's maybe hopefully we get to see improvement in that situation because it's only GSM for them. But Moto G has been pretty much like this uh, miracle phone, Since, I guess. Yeah. No, yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, we like I'm trying to get Project Fi on this thing too. So it's like um, <laughs> on the G4 Plus that I bought for my dad. And apparently, it, ironically, uh, I mentioned Asus. He has a Zenfone 3 now that was raffled off to him. And it was apparently bought from Taiwan. So, you know, the whole band issue comes into play here. And I yeah, think big time. <laughs> coverage is definitely, you know, people don't, you know, it's important that we, um, you know, figure out markets. So, it, like, th this, this is a world phone. This is a world right. class world phone. Like you can't really beat that. And you know, in terms of being able to expand your horizons, um, and also costing less in terms of uh, for Mo Lenovo and Motorola to have to you know set all those um, skews up, I think yeah. is just uh, it's it's well, a smart phone. <laughs> I, I yeah, it's a smart smartphone. Um, no, I I, I was a uh, I, I was more impressed with the device once I held it in my hand. Um, it's just now, of course, and and back to your original point, uh, and among that the uh, the market is now very competitive here. They defined the market when they originally launched the G, but they don't get to rest on their laurels and they face a lot of competition. I want to move on. Uh, speaking of you know finding your your market or finding your audience. Uh, a, a company that I think had a very divisive launch. Um, I know in our in our comments, a lot of the comments on our video for for this phone were actually pretty negative, but it, it was a very unique product to go hands on with at MWC. And of course, we're talking about the BlackBerry Key One. No more Project Mercury. No more code names that never really existed. Um, we have the actual real product coming out soon. Uh, return to the classic keyboard design, running Android, premium build materials, battery life focus, efficiency, and a price point which uh, a lot of people think might be just a bit too high. Uh, looking at some of the video coverage, I'm sure Lex probably got to go hands on it with uh, hands on with it in Barcelona. What what are your impressions? What do you think about BlackBerry's return to a uh, a, a tic tac keyboard form factor? Um, so Lex didn't have a chance to go hands on uh, at uh, uh, MWC. Well, I, you can just watch our video because our video I, was pretty much the best video on the yeah. keyboard. I mean, I did I did get hands on of it when it was the Mercury, which I think is still the same device. hasn't changed that oh, yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's more just like they've been cleaning up the software. Software. Um, I'm a bit disappointed with the device because mm -hmm. okay so one here's one of the things I, I didn't catch the press conference live i was running around but lou rod was basically sending me messages telling me what was going on <laughs> he was live and, tweeting it for you <laughs> yeah yeah and he and this is what the this is one of the things that caught my attention he says dead on arrival was the first thing and i said why and he says it has a 625 and it's 549 dollars. i will not spend that kind of money okay and when you look at it from that perspective, it is very true because you're in a market now that has two, three kings, if you will. 
Mm-hmm. Kings are Samsung, Apple, and Google. Google has fought his way to that top spot. And then right. you have uh, Knights. And BlackBerry is not one of the Knights of the round table. <laughs> Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm following. You know? I'm, I like this analogy too. Yeah. You know, like, so uh, you so you have you know you have the <laughs> LGs of the world. You have right. HTC is still one of the knights. Yes, it's it's fighting his way to stay on the round table. But it's still there. Uh, Huawei right. has pushed itself up to to that spot with their current offerings. And BlackBerry is pretty much a, a pawn at this point because he doesn't have a stake in any of the market segments that we we know, whether it's right. low, mid, or high. So coming out with a device that you know is different, it harkens back to the past, has to be one of two things. It either has to be premium, but then no one would buy, or you go after the OnePlus crowd, in a sense, right. that pricing. $400 with something that really wows in terms of performance, specs, whatever you want to do. That's what I think they should have done, and I think this is really a missed opportunity here. Because mm-hmm. at 549 I'll go buy a Galaxy S7. You know what? I think uh, we're looking at a different issue here, and that comes to little Jack Horner, who had a thumb in a whole bunch of th- uh, pies, and he was trying to get a plum. And, you know, what that plum could be, you know, plum, plums are berries, and blackberry is also a berry, so you could take that as, is you know, it's not just low, mid, and high. It's, you know, security, it's media, it's uh, all these different little, you know, intersectional Venn diagram circles. And right. what you're really trying, like, BlackBerry is keen to point out its hardened boot stack and its, um, you know, various right. software features that, you know, are preloaded and, you know, might not, you know, are available to other Android phones if you're conscious of it. And uh, you, uh, you just said it right there, though. If you're conscious of it, if you're conscious of it, and I think that you know, if you're like, you're you're not going to, if you're conscious of the BlackBerry brand, and if you're conscious of all of what the key, you know, the key one has to offer in terms of hardware and in terms of you know, it's it's hard. It's I I would say it's still hard, difficult to make the sell. I think it is a possible sell. Uh, I, I, I'm kind of in between the two of you, right? You know, like, I think BlackBerry's biggest problem with this phone will be education. Um, I think there is a market where you can sell a sub $600 phone that focuses on all day battery life efficiency. So remember, that's always been a BlackBerry hallmark. Remember, they used to have like mm-hmm. that, that sort of internet filter to help you maximize the uh, or minimize, I should say, you know, the, the bandwidth that you yeah. were consuming on your mobile device. It was all about trying to keep your device running as long as possible. And I, I, I guess I'm curious, you know, like, so Anabong, um, what? For, for the target demographic that this device might be focused at, what can the 625 not provide? It's not, it's not about target demographic in my mind. It's about the company itself and the brand. The brand has right. no weight. So I don't even, right. I'm not even thinking about target demographic. I'm thinking about almost, why would anyone want to buy a BlackBerry now? That's the main thing. And I get the security aspect of right. it, which is why you almost have to do a price gamble and say... Do we go high well, or do we go at a point where well, it's attractive I, I, enough? So, 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 so this, this is what I think is so interesting about the conversation of this phone. Because I don't think you're wrong, but I also think that there is a different focus from this company as to who they're trying to appeal to. Um, I, I think there's a consumer base out there that is probably being neglected. You know, I look at people like my wife. She hates her work iPhone. And she loved her Alcatel Idol 3, the 4.7 inch phone, because for her, that was a one hand device. You know, like that's why I like really, really small phones around the five inch screen, because for me, that's a one yeah. thumb device. You know, it, it's a, I'm running through the Barcelona airport trying to pull up information on gates. I've got a rolling suitcase, a heavy backpack. I have to go check a huge piece of luggage. And the idea of pulling out my Mate 9 was a non starter because I had to stop put everything down, put both hands up on a six inch screen and look things up where my Nova, my Huawei Nova of all phones is really easy for me to navigate what's going on. And so I'm really excited about the P10. While we're on that issue, uh, four and a half inches, four by three, hot take, Juan, go. 
four by three. Isn't isn't the screen uh, aspect ratio three by two? Three by two. Sorry, excuse. Wait. wait hold <laughs> oh on. yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, four by yeah, three. So, yeah, so, four by three. So again, again, this is this is what I think is so interesting. Is is this device is not a series of compromises. This device, I think they've 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 looked at a certain style of usage to That's try and be a king of a niche. <laughs> and now we just need to find out how big is this niche really? Because we don't I, know. I, like I, we, we I, just I don't know. That. I agree on that aspect, but I think that's the problem there is that you don't run a business just because you're trying to fulfill some really tiny specific niche somewhere. You and especially with the BlackBerry, to me, I it's almost counterintuitive because the press conference was massive. Yeah. There were a lot of people there. So if you're to me, I go if you're inviting that many people, then you're not really looking for a niche market. You're trying to go to one of these segments, and right now your device just doesn't necessarily fit that segment. I I, I get it, and I'm not I'm not to me in terms of a hardware. I think the hardware is fine. I think everything that they put in there is fine. I mean. Right. You know, for you to, to to sway the skeptics of the people like, you know, like Lou Rod, who said, I wouldn't buy is if you throw an 821 instead of 625, then it's golden. That's literally right. But if you throw chip. in an 821 in a small form factor one hand phone, then you have a phone that's dead by dinner time. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. I'm just saying that that's the mindset in terms of, you know, mindset. But I think right, but that, that's just it is like, I think what BlackBerry is trying to get away from is the enthusiast Android market. Like this See, is the, not if, yeah. if they want something like that, they can go with a DTAC has a larger screen it's got the more powerful processor that's that's great but i think they they're not wrong in a phone which doesn't highlight multimedia and i think businesses will actually be interested by that it's why, why do i want to give my employee why do i want to give my employee a 6 inch quad hd dis, uh, display for all this great youtube and netflix watching like when you just as, this you is just the company as well phone. might have a freaking samsung galaxy note like come on <laughs> No, no. See, I, I, I do agree. I'm just, I, I just look at it as, as number one. I don't think it's gonna sway that many people. And I think, no, no I, I agree think with you there. On, I, I think, think honestly, they have a branding problem, definitely. Yeah, honestly, if they were four fifty, golden. I think Although, you are at a better this, pricing this, aspect. To, so, so this, to this is where that. I, what I think is curious, and and I don't, and I'm not saying because I, I, I don't think you're wrong, but this is where I, what I think is curious, Nexus. Cheaper price points, no major consumer attachment, very, very hyper-focused on enthusiasts and Android faithful. Pixel, not that much different than a Nexus, just slightly updated specs, much higher price point. Suddenly, consumers are interested in a Google premium offering. And um, lots of marketing. <laughs> and lots of marketing. And, yeah. and so, so I think if, if TCL and BlackBerry can get after the boots on the ground problem that all of these other brands have, putting this thing in people's hands. hands if, yeah. if you're not showcasing any limitation on specs and you put this phone in your hand, it is a beautifully machined piece of engineering. We know TCL makes some great hardware. It's got that really pleasant grippy back so you don't feel like you need to put a case on it, but it feels rugged and solid and durable like you could keep this on your person, chuck it into a briefcase or into a person. It's not going to be detrimental. Has the same camera sensor as a Pixel, so we know it's going to be a solid performer there. The chipset supports 4K video, so we're not losing out on any issues there. Has an innovative keyboard has split screening app capability thanks to Android Nougat, and you don't lose anything on your screen when you go split screen because you never have to pop up a software keyboard. Fingerprint sensor in the space bar. There are so many little considered aspects of this device that I think that 550 price point might actually help it not feel like some cheap piece of crap disposable phone. Someone will buy it thinking, no, this is a high quality premium device. It's less expensive than a Galaxy. So that helps me out right there. And I get these communication features that I might really care about. You show someone the keyboard and how you can program shortcuts, like without looking at the phone, I can be calling my wife or instant messaging with my best friend before the screen has even lit up from pulling the phone out of my pocket. And I only had to use one hand to do it. I think they have a messaging issue. I don't think they have a problem in pro a, a, pro a product and pricing issue. I no, despise I, I, I enterprise because I, I do is, they've been moving. Sorry, sorry no. Hold on, hold, hold on. Sorry, sorry, Jules. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Anabong. It's a uh, yeah. Oh me? Oh, no, I do agree. They don't have a pricing issue, but I think their messaging and their brand forces them to have a pricing issue. 
I think right. that's what that's where the problem is. And I look I look at OnePlus, and granted, it took OnePlus three years to get to that point, as we right. you know, you always talk about. But OnePlus has solidified 400 as being the new mid-range flagship, in a sense. I, I again, I think OnePlus has done that with the enthusiasts. You know what I mean? I, I see. This is what this is what I think. And but and, but that but that's is, a niche also. That's the same thing right. as what BlackBerry is going for. They're going for a different type of niche. But I think the problem is now business users are now accustomed to having iPhones and Samsung Galaxies as right. the devices, and they don't care anymore. So that's why I'm saying that it's very hard because the name BlackBerry doesn't mean doesn't have a single ounce of weight to it. Well, I disagree I'll, there. I I, dis, I disagree with, okay, with maybe, no maybe weight because much. because maybe I've no 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 because <laughs> and, and and this is precisely why. Because look at what stole the show this year. I mean, I don't have it on our rundown because I don't really feel like talking about it. But Nokia stole the show in terms of the general consumer media, not not the enthusiast media, but like, you know, someone who's turning on the nightly news probably saw more about the 3310 than any other device on the show floor. And this is why I think they've got why BlackBerry has a. Uh, a branding and a messaging problem, not a product and pricing problem, is because they couldn't get out ahead of the revival of a nostalgic form factor. We, we, you know, the 3310 stole the show and it's just some crap, what, 40 euro <laughs> feature phone that plays an updated version of Snake. Yeah. And yeah. that was the big hot talking point. I, I think I, I, they, I there is a market of people out there who nostalgically remember their Crackberry addiction, and they could be tapping into that, just like Volkswagen with the new Beetle and you know Nokia with the 3310. I think there is something that you can harken back to, but if they don't have the ads, if they don't have the media, if they don't have kiosks in malls to hand people the device and say, look, look at all these things that it does. You know, the second they, they start trying to apologize to the specs junkies about, well, you know, three by two is an interesting aspect ratio and you're going to have a lot of letterboxing for video. You've, you've lost the conversation for the internet echo chamber, but you know who doesn't care about that? My dad. My dad who still works government contracts and when he has to put in an alphanumeric password, that's a major pain on an iPhone, but would be so much easier on a BlackBerry. And that really nails things down to a point where, you know, if you're talking about your dad working contract job or to uh, lawmakers in Washington, like they're the ones who go to (laughs) customers, the the house of cards that we have to keep talking about because (laughs) that's the thing that we keep talking about. But apparently Mike Pence was doing state business on a, on a personal uh, email account, like on AOL. Move (laughs) along, move along. Uh, yeah, so okay. we're like, especially, you know, but it's, it's more than that. We're talking about, uh, Blackberry's name in a BYOD market and why I think, you know, if, you know, Matt, I say marketing is not the magic bullet to everything in terms of right. what ails a smartphone. Oh no, it certainly isn't. But in this case, BYOD, it has to be it. That, you know, there, there, it has to be a, a vital element because, when people are not making channel um, purchases of smartphones, then uh, bulk, you know, orders, then, you, you know, you can't, I mean, that's the, I think there is definitely more of a case to be made to see channel orders being made because you have representatives talking with um, actual uh, product ma- uh, hardware managers and uh, IT trying to work things out. And you have actual time to um, handle that company to company. Isn't that, I, I hope I'm hoping to God that, you know, that's what BlackBerry wants to aim for instead of, you know, just blah, be, you know, go on and, um, and well, uh, uh, buy no, cause, cause I agree, Jules, it's, 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 it's shop that it's, it's also, <laughs> it's, it's also the same issue that we've talked about before where BlackBerry's a brand needs to re, uh, introduce themselves to consumers. And I would expect that a general on the ground consumer probably won't take a key series phone seriously until we're probably starting to talk about the third generation of this product. Well, who bought, um, who bought their Blackberries a decade ago? The company? I think so. I, I, it's, it's not just, you know, I, I didn't get mine at at and I got mine from the company. That's well, the, but I mean, I but at that. its peak, there were a lot of people that were rocking. I mean, you know, like even down to the jokes about how to many the bowl, drug dealers used to oh, love yeah. their yeah. blackberries the and stuff that's, like that. That's where um, but 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 I think uh, you know that that's why I'm saying is like I think that this is 
a branding issue and a messaging issue. Because when you put the phone in your hand, I seriously doubt very many consumers would notice any significant compromises in terms of things like performance. You know, um, some people might be apt to complain like, oh, my Netflix has larger um, letterboxing than phones that I'm normally used to, or, you know, oh, m this game that's super, you know, graphics intensive doesn't run quite as smooth as it might on the Galaxy. Outside of those n issues, I don't think people would be apt to really notice like, oh, well, this doesn't score as high on Geekbench, so it's obviously not a premium product. I think that's what's so fascinating about the 625 chipset. But b to your point, Enabong, I think that what we have to see is a BlackBerry who's willing to put themselves out there to really get behind their messaging, show that this is a unified catalog of devices now, not weird experiments between Passport and Priv, that this is now the BlackBerry moving forward. And I think within two years, we'll start to see much more positive conversation. And by the end of three years, I think we'll see consumers starting to treat them as a viable alternative to the heavy hitters in this market. Like I think in three years, if they can continue on this track record, continue reinforcing and get some smart media backing them up, then I think we could see them starting to climb up on LG's coattails. I think you're talking about ambitions that BlackBerry does, has given up with a TCL contract I, for a long time. I don't think so. I think I think this is this is their opportunity. I'm not saying they can execute. I'm not saying this is a foregone conclusion. And don't go investing in stocks and stuff just on, the on this kind of a conversation. You need, you need the, but I think you, it's potential. You need the driving fuel behind it. And, and investors have been telling them to ax the hardware unit, ax the hardware unit totally. for years. So with that kind of, you know, deep but, but motivational going from, factors. Then but going from the priv to the key one, and again, I mean, our, our hands-on was very limited. So this is not like an informed review or anything. I have a lot more faith in this hardware than I did in the Priv. 8.7 out of 10. <laughs> <laughs> well, moving right along to a company that doesn't have a branding issue, but has a sort of a product and supply issue until we see some more news from them. <coughs> Samsung, it, it's easy to overlook. Samsung was on the MWC show floor, but of course they didn't have a phone to show off. They had a pair of tablets, the S3 and the Samsung book was it the galaxy tab s3 book? galaxy or, book yeah the galaxy tab, book. tab s3 and, <coughs> and galaxy book yeah and so uh jaime went on went hands-on with the windows hardware i played around with the android hardware s pen productivity features were definitely the highlight of bringing uh bringing samsung's uh new tablets up to speed uh not only great multimedia features we would expect that but then also you can get your work <sighs> done on these things too um, Enabong, what did you think for a, a company that has been in the media for a lot of the wrong reasons over the last couple of months? Um, do, do Was there a, a gaping hole in tablets or people looking for larger slate experiences? Is this something that's going to get people talking about Samsung in the near term before we get our big announcement at the end of this month? Um, they, there was a little, yeah, little holes in tablets. On the Android side, yes, there's almost nothing uh, to be excited about so it was good to see the tab s3 show up uh, because i believe right now if you want an android tablet is it's literally lenovo and huawei and samsung that's pretty right. much it i mean the other smaller companies but from the big guys the tab s3 i did like i like the hdr support samsung only does hdr 10 so there's no dolby vision on this if you're looking for that right. um and I also like the s pen functionality on there i thought i thought the bezels were a little too thick for me mm -hmm. But then again, it's an Android tablet, so why why go through all the stress of reducing right. vessels, in a sense? So, but it was it was nice. I liked the functionality. I also liked the Galaxy Book, the twelve inch book. The ten inch book for me felt a little too small. I agree. Um, the twelve inch felt nice. I didn't like the keyboard f feel. I mean, the keys. <laughs> It, it didn't felt it a feel like there was there was like that. It was it's for me. It's all around the FGH where you can watch the 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 entire keyboard bow. You know what I mean? I when you're in I the middle I of the keyboard and that. the whole thing flexes. Oh, and 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 that's like Bluetooth keyboard territory for me, where I'd rather just have something like that little flop out Microsoft Bluetooth keyboard, just because yeah. it doesn't have that flex feel in the middle. When you're I mean, typing. I mean, typing on it because I was, you know, I was typing on the surface, like on a table itself. So it was fine typing using the keys, but 
it felt a little Fisher Pricey. Didn't I mean not felt it looked Fisher Pricey. Didn't feel like that, but I just had that in my mind while right. using it. Um, I did like the fact they had two um, USB C ports, Glorious. so one for charging and one, of course, for data transfer. Um, it was nice. I mean, it's it's a nice tablet. The pen functionality was good. I'm just wondering what price point it jumps into because you know the 10 inch is a Core M processor. It's a um, mm-hmm. seventh generation Core M, but it's still a Core M, and the and the <laughs> uh, the 12 inch is a Core i5. And so I want to know where that 12 inch falls in terms of pricing because it could be an in- interesting um, pickup for people who like the Surface. Maybe the Surface feels too expensive, and Samsung gives them a slightly cheaper option right. than that. And then I think that would weigh where it would excel. Because if it's more expensive than the Surface, I think most people will go with the Surface anyway at yeah. that point. So, what, What's um, an iFi Surface uh, Pro 4 cost right now? 1300 or so? Uh, I don't know. Actually, if 12, you guys 13. keep talking, I will look it up. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly. But, um, but I think anything that comes slightly below that, I think, will be attractive to consumers in terms of uh, picking up. Uh, the one thing I just don't like is that keyboard case. I don't like putting down. I just want to just flip it and open. That's just me. I, I'm not a fan of, you know, opening the tablet and fixing right. the st- like. I, I just oh no, they're like using that. pogo pins. They're so easy to use those <laughs> yeah. pogo pins. Yeah, uh, just just not uh, just not my my. Thing. Okay, so an Intel Core i5, four gigabytes of RAM, one hundred and twenty eight gig solid state drive, Surface Pro four starts at nine nine ninety nine. Nine ninety nine. All right. And they, so all right. Yeah. So, so if Samsung can make the play, so I mean, like, really, say you started like with a thousand dollars in your sights on a twelve-inch um, sort of ultra portable modular computer like this, and you can just do something simple like bump up the storage or double the RAM and keep that with like all of the other benefits too, like the AMOLED display and the yeah, S Pen yeah. functionality, and, and we the should dual also USB C ports that could be pretty epic. And we should yeah. also consider the Intel Core uh, generation jump as well because uh, that also oh, that's true, prices. that's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's KB Lake, so uh, you do have that. But I I thought it was solid offerings. Again, since Samsung didn't mention price, that's just weird. Especially even with the Android tablet too, because Android yeah. tablets have no. I mean, like, there's no reason for me to pick one up at all. Well, I mean, so, even iPad sales are slowing up. So, I mean, I think the consumer the consumer awareness of tablets right now is people who want them have what they want, and they're going to hold on to them for a really long time because. Why refresh your tablet? Why yeah, exactly. be on the bleeding edge there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I definitely agree. Uh, but it was also good to see the tease of the S8. Actually, you know what? They shouldn't have teased it. They should have just put all the leaked images that we saw <laughs> seen online. <laughs> because after the tease this week, uh, EV Leaks dropped a massive, big image yeah, of the Galaxy S8. And I was like, mm-hmm. can you just have your event next week? <laughs> right. Or, I mean, at this point, I, 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 for it to be at the end of the month, I understand Samsung's not wanting to share the, the, the limelight, but, you know, we were all out there. You had the press out there. Why not just have a, a, a mini press conference? You know people would have gone to it or make it a part of their, of their main press conference to, to talk about what was going on with that. It's, uh, you know, it, it, I think it'll be curious to see how people respond to... I- the essay at the end of this month. I, I think it'll be fine. I think one thing they did was with the Oscars. Uh, I know you didn't watch the Oscars this weekend, but you know, <laughs> right. Samsung sponsors the Oscars. And my God, did they apologize for battery life, battery issues <laughs> with ads. Every every break, they tagged it with, oh, here's a Galaxy S7 ad. Ooh, it's cool. And we're really sorry about exploding batteries. We've gone in and we fixed the problem. So they they spent this weekend with MWC just more or less saying, we're really sorry. We apologize. We have everything working right again. And in the so meantime, everyone that's coming back from Barcelona is still seeing the signs for the Galaxy Note 7. And how about you, you have to freaking <laughs> right. dump it uh, at the freaking uh, <laughs> entry? Oh, poor Samsung. Samsung. Yeah. Well, wah, wah, sad trombone. 
Um, uh, moving on from a company that sad trombone because of last year's product to a company that seems to be in a bit of a timing squeeze. I uh, wanted to get your thoughts on Sony's crazy lineup of Xperia products, devices. Um, the XZS and the XZ Premium were definitely the most talked about, but it, it's tough getting worked up about phones that are announced now and then possibly not shipping internationally until the end of Q3 or the beginning of Q4. Um, what, what did you think about what Sony's commentary was for, for this lineup of, of products? Um, you know, I've been sort of hot and cold on Xperia's in the past, especially recently with this X line. Um, but some interesting discussion about things like HDR 4K displays and 960 frame per second burst mode, uh, slow motion for the camera. Um, what, what do you think? Is this the right strategy for Samsung? Announce early, wait until the product's ready, or should they have held this off until it was a more finished uh, gadget? You mean Sony? Yeah. Did you get to play with the OS at all? Okay, so we, we had the XZ Premium hands-on, um, and they, they, I mean, Sony was right. They, were, they, they made a big play, like, please don't show any of the software on camera. It is in a state of pre-alpha. So there was nothing we could show about the XE Premium, which I felt would have been fair to the f fair to the phone. Basically, we just had sort of the hardware mock-up, and it's super like fingerprint smudgy, mirror finish phone. Um, but yeah, the software was not ready to go. The camera wouldn't open. Apps were crashing. The UI was barely functional. This sounds um, like vaporware. That sounds like Kickstarter. No, 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 no. This, it's not. It's, I mean, like they they are legitimately just, putting out a phone. I mean, yeah, closer but just, to the just summer, like the but... sounds of all those things that you just yeah. said just combine and you know Be because <laughs> because i heard um i was talking to alex and i was like hey have you seen the um the sony device he's like yeah the, it's like they won't let me touch the software this is early i was like then in true sony fashion as we do in border work i don't care because <laughs> sony does this every single year and i'm looking at the specs right now gsm arena and i'm going hdr 10 compliant okay yeah. Um, you've got a 4K display, 809 PPI, um, mm -hmm. X Reality Engine, Android 7.0. I mean, it, this is the fanboy dream of cell phones. Mm -hmm. And by the time it launches, the Galaxy Note 8 will crush it in its sights. Right. And that's or my problem with this. <laughs> and even that was still crush it in its sights. Right. I mean, like, let's not forget that until they were all completely shut off, that the Note 7 was was still outperforming the V20. <laughs> <Right>. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so that's where my problem is, is that I, I'm, I'm fine with all this. I mean, they even have Aptex X. I th believe this device actually supports Aptex HD, which gives you mm -hmm. better high-def audio on your, uh, of your Bluetooth. So everything I like, I want to see, except Quick Charge 3.0, I'm not a fan of that one, <laughs> is in this device. <laughs> and I'm going, Sony... You know, this is a ch this is a time for you to to really push this, or you waited and you should have done a separate event and said, "Hey, here's what we're doing." But the problem, again, like you said earlier, Juan, is Sony. This device is never going to come to the U.S. Number one, number right. two, we don't even know we don't know when it's going to even come in a, in the rest of the markets out there on the planet. And is Sony even going to back these devices with any kind of marketing push that would say, "Hey, we've built something that you will definitely want to pick up." All right. right. You know what really sucks about this? Um, so uh, Android Central had the scoop last week on um, the whole fingerprint sensor issue in mm -hmm. the U.S. Uh, and just w what it's like being like this second tier OEM. Like you talk about Knights of You mean third tier? Third tier. Whatever well, yeah, so non-existent Sony, oh, Sony, yeah, I'm in the US. So, in the US. Sony is the guy who's trying to join the Knights of the Round Table, and he's going through the trial process. Then he quits. <laughs> I was going to say, if we're going to use the Knights <laughs> of the Round Table analogy, Sony is from Monty Python's Knights of the Round <laughs> Table <laughs> right now. But the fingerprint sense, it see, it sounded like what they were doing with the like they were only carried by T-Mobile and. Verizon for the duration of when they had the you know the new Xperia Z series, and right. um, apparently they you know they had to make some deals with the devil in order to do so. And when you know things uh, turned you know south on those deals, and uh, 
apparently, you know, one one of the things when they went decided to continue to push into the U.S. market with an uh, with an unlocked approach, mm-hmm. that fingerprint sensor had to go. There, this one stipulation in you know one of those carrier deals somehow had to do with it. That's that's what we're inferring from that. So wait, 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 and, wait, wait I oh, okay. What was this, is it? The fingerprint sensor on the button? Yeah, the home button. Yeah, I mean, button? not the home button, the power button on the side. It's the power button yeah. on the side, oh, okay. capacitive, right. capacitive. And apparently, you know, that, that ability was, you know, taken up now uh, uh, because of a carrier deal. Like, and we've been talking about these things with Samsung, um, you know, having all those software takes done by Verizon and just how much power that, you know, the carriers have uh, in this day and age, in 2017, when they're to- like, I think the one thing that saved those carriers and has, you know, destroyed, um, that has been able to whittle down OEM competitiveness mm-hmm. in the in the U.S. field, is their transition from contracts to, um, uh, financing to uh, right. device installment yeah. plans, and when you're seeing, uh, comp- you know, OEMs not being able to fight into uh shelves like they're trying to mm-hmm. do their own things they're trying and they're trying to do their own uh financing options and you know what they even then they they were the uh the carriers were the first ones that were able to provide this you know more beneficial option to uh consumers and they have the bigger names out there in the end so that's i i sony's just fighting a losing battle i think on that although point. you know what what i think is interesting and and i mean not not to play devil's advocate but just as one interesting data point i'm that's sort of the word of this podcast for me is interesting, interesting. <laughs> uh, you know it's really interesting guys um <laughs> but sony's last quarter with the xz was actually pretty solid i mean they posted some strong growth numbers they they were one of the highest selling android handsets and we're basing of this the, off of, of one quarter. market report well uh, but 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 again i mean you know just to be that fair. was a trend that was positive for sony and that's one of the few positive discussions that we've had about the sony brand recently um that i thought was just a you know, that th- there's potential. I think there's potential Sony Global, maybe not as much in the United States because they just don't seem to have the same kind of initiative to break open this U.S. market right now. But that doesn't mean that this is this is a brand that's completely dead or has no signs of life. Like, there's there's a heartbeat here. And if they can follow it up with some interesting products, I just don't believe, to your point, Anabong, I don't think announcing now will reserve people's cash for a phone launching so late in the year. Mm-hmm. And that where I, th- I do agree. That's where I think Sony made a misstep here. I want these features. I want that camera burst. I want this display. I, water resistance. If I, I don't even know if it's going to be a water resistant device. I'm assuming it will be. Stereo speakers. Those hallmark Sony things I want. I, if I'm in the market to buy a phone now, it's a non-starter. I'm I not going to wait. Yeah. The yeah. honest truth is... Is this device will probably launch after Eva, and <laughs> right, and you might as well even if you announce all this at Eva, iPhone eight. We, no, right. I mean yes, yes, it's the iPhone eight. But I'm saying that even if you announce this at Eva, and you said you came out strong, you put out devices out. I mean, again, companies sometimes some companies understand what to do. Sometimes other companies don't. And we're going to right. talk about LG very soon. LG's, I think, kind of got it right a little bit in the sense that everybody and their grandmother had a G6 this last week. Yep. You know, which means everybody knows the G6 is coming out. Mm-hmm. Granted, they didn't, they didn't need to put ads on, on YouTube or on the web or even run TV ads, but they gave influencers. I mean, that's right. just one way of doing things. And at least that's what I mean Sony needs to do. If Sony were to launch this device... It, yes, the iPhone is always going to beat it. We know that. The Galaxy will beat it. But you need to fight for your market space. The problem is they don't want to fight for anything other than PlayStation. Let's just be frank. Yeah, that is pretty much it at this point. So it doesn't matter if they announce it now or later. It's what did they do with that announcement afterwards that says, hey, you know what? Why don't you come back and check out the Xperia? Because yes, even though you like the Galaxy, you like the iPhone, you like the Pixel... 
our phone literally can kill all those with a smack <laughs> in the back of the head. Well, and and I think that's that's um that's the tricky timing aspect too. Is by the time this phone fall, comes out, it's actually released and people can give money to Sony to own it. Do we think that it's going to feel stale? Even if it's the most amazing bleeding edge tech, we'll have talked it to death before people will actually be able to, to buy it. No, actually we won't. No one's talking about it. That's the thing. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we should probably move Sony on. Has, then if no Sony has two no little talking about freaking it. capital anyways in terms of uh, mindshare. So mindshare, whatever yeah. they do. Well, well then, then yeah, let's, let's move on. Um, then uh, I feel bad then if we've already talked about it too much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> moving on to a company, uh, let, let's, let's tackle the LG G6. This, was, uh, this is a critical phone launch for LG. Again, keeping in with the theme of everything else that we've been talking about, it's not just about releasing a good product. It's showing that the company's behind it. It's getting the messaging right. It's about um, calming any consumer fears about reliability. Obviously, they didn't have exploding battery problems, but LG has had sort of a a, a hard uh, reputation to walk away from, from the boot looping issues of the G4. And so now we are going hands-on with the LG G6, a very unique device, one that I think feels a a lot better in the hand than uh, the... Than, than what it looks like on paper. I was not excited about this new screen aspect ratio. I should probably turn mine on if you want to focus in on Enabong's camera because he <laughs> does have his on. Um, so so you've been playing with it for uh, for a couple of days now. What what are your sort of initial impressions on LG's experiment? Oh my God, here? the gloss, the gloss. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the the gloss on the on the black, I'm not a fan of. I wish I had the silver one. That's that's my minor gripe on this device. I, I will say though that I have been quite impressed with this. Battery life, even though they say this is not final, is fantastic. It's been really good. I say it is absolutely fantastic. And I'll put it this way. So I went to Samsung had a thing here in New York. So I, I went to go record uh footage of the 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 Tab S3 in the Galaxy Book. I walked out of my house with my backpack, my tripod, my phones, and I left my camera at home. <laughs> so I hate I, when that happens. So I what said, is going on with you guys at Border Working Cameras? I mean, yeah, really. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> so I said, this is a great opportunity to fire up this bad boy and record footage. So my footage for the Galaxy Book and the Tab S3 are fully from this. And it did a fantastic job. I recorded maybe a total of about 20 video clips. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, average uh, size, average runtime is about a minute or so each clip. And my battery went from 100 to 83% with nice. all that 4K recording. I mean, it did warm up quite a bit while right. recording in 4K. But um, I've liked the, I like the screen aspect ratio. I like the skinniness of it, you know? Yeah. It, 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 it allows for, I'm sure it allows for people with smaller hands to navigate much freely. For me, it's not a problem, but <laughs> I do like that. So I'm, I'm beginning to test the audio because this doesn't have a quad DAC, which is a little right. disappointed in there. But he still has a 24-bit uh, 192 kilohertz Signal DAC. processing, yeah. Signal processing, yeah. yeah, yeah. Here. Uh, which is it's not bad. It's actually it's actually uh, been good so far with my. Uh, I just started listening to audio off this about two days ago, so I'm still trying to form an opinion. Granted, this is not a review unit, so I can't. Review yeah, and, and and I think for everyone out there, I was very frustrated when I saw a couple outlets going straight to reviews. And this isn't this isn't finished software. This is I'm pretty confident this is finished hardware, and we will be getting updates, but. You know, the, I feel it's very irresponsible for any outlet to be saying this is the verdict on the LG G6. That's our that's hands on review. Now. Our hands on first impressions review. <laughs> so yeah, this is. Um, I mean, overall, I, I can say I do like the device quite a bit. Um, you know, in all all intents and purposes, you know, this is what the G5 should have been. Maybe not exactly. the display. Because I don't right. think we had that last year. But just the overall finish, the cameras, everything you get with it. You're like, yeah, we could have had this last year, you know, to some degree. Well, that would know? have been my follow-up question is I feel. Um, so I'll, I'll load my question with an opinion and then ask you. Okay. <laughs> no, I feel like this, this is a brand. This is a design language that LG can grow with now. 
like we're, the G5 just felt like an amorphous blob of primer coating paint focused on that modular experiment that really wasn't a design language. Mm -hmm. This to me seems like, I, I don't know, what are, what are your thoughts? Do you think this is now something that we can expect to see from LG in the future? Is it something they can build off of for future devices? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, you can still make this bezel thinner if you wanted to. That's right. just the first uh, aspect of it. Uh, yes, yes, God. thin bezels. Thin bezels. <laughs> also, 2017 trend watch curved um curved the like radius right. displays that, that infinity sucked. pool yeah. displays, displays yeah. Those, those other those phones coming out but yeah it's, it's it's a very good design language for them to go with um i think one of the things um that lg needs to fix as they move forward is so for instance the quad dac is going coming to korea we know that um mm -hmm. and I think they need to have some kind of unity across the board, especially for a flagship device. Yes. You know, th there's one thing, it's one thing if you're like Samsung, if you switch between the Exynos and 835, just because of supply of band chain and, carrier issues, yeah. and band chain and that kind of stuff. But the performance is literally almost the same, you know, especially now with Samsung fabbing the, totally. <laughs> the, the chipset. Well, and Apple does the same thing with different chipset manufacturers so, and different radios for different markets. But markets, ultimately, yeah. it sh you shouldn't be able to tell that there's any significant difference in feature set. Yeah, so th that's what I would like them to fix. But I think overall, now the one thing they tried to they tried to talk about a lot was the eighteen by nine aspect ratio. I remember when I went to my briefing, um, yeah, they they talked about that extensively. Right. And I and for me, it, it it's great when you're doing things like the square camera and you have you know that screen there and you you know you take a picture and you go, oh, I can view, I can review easily. It looks great. But yeah. watching video content, eh, it's fine. I mean, you you know, isn't it? Some isn't it funny? Like how our... showing his <clears throat> contempt for Instagram right now. No, 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 no. What 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 I think is funny is how easily we will accept letterboxing, but man, does pillar boxing look weird? It it I mean, does. It <laughs> it's so gonna look weird, even especially... weirder. It's gonna look even weirder on the Galaxy S8 because it's. 18.5 by 9. No, no, no. I, I, I agree. No, I mean, like, what, what I think is funny is, like, for when I'm holding the phone, I really like the back on the sort of silverish, bluish color because it doesn't really show fingerprint smudges at all. But when yeah. I'm looking at the front face, I wish it had black bezels because pillar boxing looks weird with this yeah. bluish silver trim, black bars on the sides of the video. And then I'm looking at widescreen content because the phone is wider than the video feed is. That to me is, is actually been the most distracting part of using this phone. It's um, like and it's not something I ever would have expected anyways. would have been that like, big a deal. On. I come don't on. want any bezels. <laughs> no I want a floating bezel. screen. Shut them down. <laughs> Shut them down. <laughs> That's hilarious. So, uh, so in, in, your, in your general usage, um, I, I think this was also the biggest question. I know, like, we got so many annoying fanboy questions at our pre-brief on the ground in Barcelona. And it was one of the most beautiful moments. Again, let's do a little inside baseball. It was one of the most beautiful moments when uh, one of the tech writers holds up his hand and, like, point blank throws down on an LG rep. Why doesn't this have the 835? Why didn't uh, yeah. you wait to release it until it had the 835? I think I and knew who LG, asked that question. And the LG rep, LG rep turns to him and says, like, well, what... No other phones are being released or announced at this show with the 835. And he interrupts the LG rep and goes, oh, oh, Sony's announcing. And it was the most beautiful moment, the closest I've ever seen a PR get to like a smack ban hammer. Yeah. He goes, and when will that phone ship? And he just doesn't break eye contact with the writer. <laughs> and you're like, uh, oh, I mean, like Q4, you're like, right, we're releasing a phone today <laughs> or announcing a phone today we're announcing yeah. a phone today um so to your point though about the different SKUs, i think one of the things that's important for our, our audience to know um korea is getting the quad dac the usa is getting wireless charging so i think you know that's yeah. sort of an interesting lifestyle um compromise the market that i think is going to get boned is europe because they're not guaranteed to get wireless charging or the quad oh. DAC. And that's where <laughs> this conversation gets really tough because you have some features in some markets, some features in others, and then a few markets that are getting neither. And I LG think that's going to be... Europe. 
you know, like Germany, screw you. Um, that's where I think the conversation on this phone is going to get tricky is I'm going to be talking about it from the perspective of being an American. And I think that's only going to serve to frustrate some of our viewers in Europe who won't be getting some of those features. Yeah, no, it will. Uh, there's one thing I wanted to point out. I'm going to show you in a second is I'm sorry, but I am not a fan of the app tray positioning on this thing. When you switch to the app tray, I really? don't know if, yeah, it is too high. It is way up here. Mm. It should have been a, just, yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. It's, it's, it's like wasted space in my mind. I you know, and, and I'll, I'll be curious. That, yeah, that, um, yeah because then, then there's this space here and then this is what, this is all you're using. Oh, how did you switch it to there? So that's, that's how it popped up on mine. Um, but it's still pretty high. It's not yeah. as high as on yours, that, though. I that think it's really just strange. about as high as both of yours, and uh, it's you know it's that 1080p. Uh, that that um, I think that's one of the things that they should be able to. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I can move it around. Off. Yeah, but but oh, it's wait, still yeah. yeah okay I, I can do that. But yeah. but I'll be curious to see because you know I'm 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 such a horror for Nova Launcher, um because what I'd like to do is get that pixel <laughs> version where there's not an app drawer icon just you just up. slide yeah. up. From yeah. the bottom, and mm -hmm. I don't know that Nova. I, I'm going to have to install it when we're done with this podcast. I don't know that Nova's going to handle the aspect ratio well. Oh, okay. While you're talking, I'm going to start installing it then. <laughs> I'm going to try and check Live that out. I mean, if you can do it before air. we're done with the show. Live yeah. to um, tape, but actually. I, yeah, really, exactly. Um, but it has been really interesting. Uh, now you know it. It isn't really interesting. It's been really gratifying. <laughs> Um, getting to play with some of these features, uh, some of my favorite V20 features in a phone, which is so much easier for me to use one handed. Um, that has actually been, I think the major talking point, because I think we can move on to the last, uh, the last topic on our rundown, talking I mean, the Huawei announcements, the Huawei I'll argue P10, against the, that, but go ahead. The Huawei P10, the P10 plus and the watch Two, which I'm also wearing right now. Um, that, that has been, I think the most exciting aspect of MWC for me was at the end of 2016, my favorite two phones were the Mate 9 and the LG V20, but not being a big fan of phablets, it's always crazy for me. Like all of those features, all of that hardware, all of that power, and I have to put up with the biggest phones on the market. And now with the P10 and the G6, I get a lot of those features in a much yeah. more manageable form factor. That phone definitely so, remarking upon a, a time of renewal. Be, be, before of we continue. Of freshness, of growth. Hold on, you, okay. do we have, a, we have an, an answer on, on Nova? Yeah, we oh, do. Oh, that looks clean. And then, that looks dope. Wow. Uh, that is, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I'm going to have to switch over to Nova Launcher. I like that a lot. Mm. All right, good deal. All right, thank, thank you for, for taking the hit on that one because I'm trying to keep the, the show up and I couldn't install it while we were talking. Um, no but, uh, you know, so the LG G6, it's a much larger departure from anything that we've seen LG do. Uh, Huawei, was, um, this year is a lot more about iteration. It's a lot more subtle, very, very small, uh, I think, in terms of design language. It's very, very similar to the P9 yeah, last year. Renewal and, and, and freshness and, uh, you know, vital <laughs> but, life. But like, let's, let's not, let's not change over too many of the things that work. Let's just kind of touch little elements along the way to refresh the line and, and make it updated for this year. Uh, Anabong, what, what did you think about the, uh, the Huawei announcements? It's uh, the color of the sky. <laughs> I, I do, I do have the blue one. I'm very excited that I have this, this blue back. Yeah, we and have shimmery the... lighting and stuff. And I think it's it clear. Looks it's really, supposed really to calm pretty. your mind. Wow. I, I avoided I watched, greenery like the plague. I watched. I, I watched too much of the whole Pantone um, discussion. So <laughs> there are there oh, are two. God, colors that was that was a green. miserable part of their press conference. Um, they uh, so we have the silver. Is this? Is this I think it's the silver one or the blue. Mm -hmm. I can't, no, no, yeah, we have. The, it's more. It's more like the I, P9, the silver. Yeah, I think that's what we have. I have to check the unboxing because <laughs> Alex did that. We didn't get a chance to check out the watch. Uh, Alex wasn't able to get the the watch at the show, but. From the P10, um, you know, I, I would I would relay Alex's own comments on this because, of course, I haven't actually right. touched the device. But he was really excited about the device. He liked the camera off the mm -hmm. bat, um, especially he hasn't used a lot of uh, Huawei devices. Uh, I think he's used a bunch of the low end ones, so he was right. actually excited to to use this. Uh, the feel of the device he also liked. Um, also. 
uh, the the trimming and also what Huawei gives you. The box presentation, I think, is one of the things that he also pointed out. It's the fact that because to, to, Alex is an Apple fanboy. Let me just put it out there. So, so for I don't him, think you're outing him for that. I think he's pretty public about yeah, it. Yeah. So, so for him, those are the kind of things that he always pays attention to, and he likes that. And you know, when he opened, he did his unboxing, kind of opened it up like two uh, uh, double doors opening and um, opening up the kind traffic. Of Exactly. Yeah, as you can hear in the background. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I think from I mean, from that and also what I heard at the uh, press conference, um, I mean, it's it's nice. What I'm not sure with Huawei is what is the strategy with all your devices? Because I don't know what a flagship is for with Huawei anymore, or it's just that's how they are doing things. Like if that's right. truly how they are doing to drop devices with the uh the peas the mates and what's the other line they have i think they have one more well they, i mean the, the the i don't know that it's going to be a continued line with the nova the nova was i think their response to google not working with them on the pixel and so i think those were the shells that they were pitching for a future nexus device mm -hmm. and when but google said you can't have any branding on it huawei walked away from the table and that's why google went with htc for the pixel but I don't know that they're going to be a continued line. But Maybe. they do have this uh, weirdo uh, cycle where it's beginning to show up in uh, spring and then in December. And then there's this odd September release where it's just maybe the Mate S or the Nova. Like, well, there has to be something. Yeah, but do, I, I, do we think that that's really that strange? I mean, Samsung launches a Galaxy S and an S Edge, and then you have the Note later on in the year. So I kind of feel like the P and the P Plus at the beginning of the year with a Mate to push well, the mean, specs farther at the end of the year. Maybe. I'm, th I'm just thinking of adding that third leg on with the, you know, mid-range. Yeah, and whatnot. I, I, I'm not too sure, but I, I do understand where they're going. And I, I do like that. I, I do like what they're doing. I just want to mm -hmm. see... I just want to see how it continues from year to year. If it's if they set the... You know, they fall on the same Samsung strategy of, okay, two devices, one's a mate, one's a P. And then we have our honor line as being that, you know... You yeah. Know, Low sort of fast, the lower cost, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, line. But altogether, I mean, I mean, Huawei is proving to show that they are the um, the big boys in the market. You know, they, yeah. they've they've shown which each event that they know how to market without spending marketing dollars. Yeah, big time. You know, Forcefully. you supply, yeah, yeah, you supply reviews. You also push out announcements, and then you make it really clear to people that yeah. This is a device that you definitely should pick up. So, you know, granted, they're not picked up by any carrier in the U.S. No carrier, pick, you know, carries a Huawei device. You can buy it off Amazon or I think Huawei directly, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, so it, I, I like what they're doing. I just want to see them continue it. I like To me, I almost have no qualms. I mean, I haven't played with the device itself. So once I get my hands on it, I can say, okay, maybe they need to change a few things here or there. I know they made improvements with their OS last year with the Mate mm -hmm. 9. And as long as they keep doing that and making it feel fresh, or somebody should please buy Nova Launcher and make that feel fresh on the <laughs> device, I think, I think it would just go a long way. But I, so far, I'm, I'm liking what they've done. I haven't tried out the watch. I wanted to ask you, though, how is the Huawei watch? Okay, so the Huawei Watch, I think, is, is uh, again, it's so polarizing. So the first generation Huawei Watch is was sort of in that vein of Moto 360. Let's try and make a premium timepiece, something that would dress up really well, but something that you can still wear casual, yeah. nice circular display and everything. Wouldn't the, wear it for a lot the, of my life. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the Huawei Watch, is definitely going for yeah. a sportier look. It, it's um, you know, sort of a combination of ceramic front face, thermoplastic shell around the side, steel back plate, and I think they're trying to make this uh, uh more more focused on all of the updates to Android Wear 2.0, which are uh, fitness watch focused, and so mm -hmm. they're completely different animals. So I can totally appreciate why some people are looking at the the original Huawei Watch and looking at the Huawei Watch 2. And this isn't a sequel. This this is this is a different product line. It's not an update or a refresh to what we liked about the original Huawei Watch. So this is a, a bold, chunky 
um, rugged D, rugged adjacent kind of watch, which isn't really my personal style coming from a Pebble, but the hardware I think is on point for the people that they're trying to target, the demographic of users that they might want to target. And I love the updates to Android Wear 2.0. I think this helps the Android Wear ecosystem a lot. Um, but whether or not this will be uh, like a, a full-time watch for me, probably not. It's not really my style, but I like where they're going with this for the right consumer. The problem is going to be, does this feature set make sense for a customer at a $350 price point when, you know, like you can buy an Honor 6X for 250 bucks and their <laughs> watch is, is way up there. But this is also the LTE enabled version. We're going to be playing with that with Android Wear. It's NFC. I, I'm going to go and try and do some mobile payments with it. Wi-Fi enabled, Bluetooth enabled, ambient light sensor, really, really good outdoor viewable OLED display. The battery life for me on these first couple days has been kind of weak though. So with all of these different features and me breaking into it and really trying to get a feel for what it can do, um, this is this has been struggling to last the day. I think that'll get better um, once I've had a little bit more time to break it in and get used to it. And also, I've got to find a new watch band for it because it is just one of those sort of rubbery, plasticky sport bands that I don't really like very much. Okay. Um, but on the whole, the, I, it, like I've liked again, this is another one of those things like the G6, like the P10. I like it better than I thought I would when I saw the press briefing and I saw the pictures of it. I thought this was going to be a piece of shit. Um, actually wearing it, using these new features, the build construction, the um, what I think it brings to the table, I like it a lot better than what my on, on paper impression was of it. Okay. So here's the thing that I'm going to be watching out for, and that is with you know market share numbers. Honest, even with you know the whole critical uh, discourse that mm -hmm. Tizen is certainly you know it's not the first choice for anyone out there, uh, but you know you got well, Samsung, you got Name, and wasn't the frontier, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, watches. Jules, but yeah. wasn't the Frontier like one of the hottest selling smartwatches behind the Apple Watch? Exactly, yeah. that's my point in terms of sales. In terms of sales, like you know, you guys can talk about you know, it's it's kind of a crap interface, uh, but they have no, that no, 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 no. It is not a crappy interface. What is wrong with you? It is still better than Android Wear 2.0. I'm sorry, <clears throat> it is that rotating screen. Um, sorry, the um, bezel. bezel. It just makes everything hundred percent golden. And I thought the same. The thing. only thing, the only maybe, the I, only maybe thing I'm that bugs me about it with that. the Tizen OS in general, as opposed to um. No, uh, so I mean, like, again, I, I think what we're looking at, Android Wear 2.0 brings some of the mentality of Apple Watch and Tizen in that you can have actual apps running from the watch. It's not all just the notification and the cards. Okay. The, thing, the thing that bugged me about the Frontier, and this is so small, this is not a reason why anyone should not go out and buy this, was how much I love that rotating bezel for navigating the UI. And then I would still have to touch the screen to activate an app. And I just wanted one of those buttons on the watch to be a launch button, you know, so that if I wanted to, I could go pure hardware and never have to touch the, I mean, the I mean, touch they, screen. They could have just done three buttons, two, and then one on the third one on the other side. Right. So it's row, row, rotate, rotate. Because and... it's like it's like on the Pebble, you've got up and down and select. You know, you've got an up button, a down button. And oh, then when you, you get manual to the button, phone you user. Select it. Come on, I, touch I, the I, screen. But I love that because... Touch it. No, because the, the whole point of a watch is like... I've got, I'm like cleaning fingerprint smudges off of it and crap like that. Like I, I want to be able to just, I've got this thing. I want to activate this app and I've already beautifully dialed in from the bezel, the rotating bezel. And then I can't get the last step in just hardware. But anyway, um, you know, I've already covered the, the frontier. I, I, I think um, to your point, Jules, this, this doesn't save the smartwatch industry. This doesn't really give it a huge it shot. It doesn't save just, Android Wear OEMs. No, not at all. But like I said before, I like this a lot better than I thought I was going to. So for the people out there that are maybe in the market for a solution like this, they have an option. I think they've got a solid option with the LG watches. I love what LG's doing with Google on that crown, having the rotating crown, which is sort of similar to Samsung's rotating bezel for navigating the UI. I think that kind of stuff is super, super smart. Um, but again, it, it's about whether or not these companies can make the case for for being also lifestyle, for being a piece of jewelry. 
You know, this is one of the only fashion accessories that I'm also allowed to wear as a dude. Like I can't go be sporting a bunch of gold chains and rings and stuff like that. That's not that's Ooh, not what we but, get to wear. Well, why not? <laughs> because we're not we're not no 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 no. that's that's what i mean is like you're wearing a very simple accent you're but but you know you're showing off a watch yeah you know what i mean when when your sleeve is just sort of that the cuff of your sleeve is just rolled back and people still look at that timepiece i still like watch people how they accessorize with timepieces i love jeans and a t-shirt and a swatch watch and i love stepping it up to something cleaner and sharper when I want to wear slacks and some nice shoes. You know, mm -hmm. that, that something is still something that's important to me with what little fashion or style I can claim to have. <laughs> and I don't know that a Huawei or an LG can make the same argument that a Tag Heuer or um, a Fossil, you know, a Fossil can make a, a certain kind of statement that a tech company still can't make. Mm-hmm. Right, so is that is that so? Are we talking about good steps here, and uh, hopefully a good, you know, impression going forward for Edward Wear Two Point Well, I definitely think that the the step forward is for fitness. Like this is a big update for people who wanted better fitness tracking on Android Wear. I think the jury's still out on whether or not the this is the right step for the watch side of the equation. Right now, I think this does a great job of putting a big hurt on Fitbit. You know, Fitbit's in trouble. They're, they're kind of floundering in the market. They made a bunch of acquisitions, but we haven't seen that translate into future devices, exciting new uh, products. Um, we we'll probably might not see anything by the end of this year, uh, just because it takes a while to get that stuff out in the pipeline. And at the same time, they're facing extreme competition from updates on Apple Watch, on Samsung, and now on Android Wear 2.0. Um, I, I think that it makes a good case for this market maturing and that we've got the three big players. And I think they're in that order. I think it's Apple Watch, Samsung, and then Android Wear. Well, uh, my hope oh, is mean, that... Oh, you mean Fitbit being the market leader, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's what yeah. I mean for this year. For, for yeah, what for we see year, with new for... products, when, when you can say like, hey, this is a Google-enabled product. It's going to work with your Android phone. It'll work well with your iPhone. And... Man, look at all these crazy improvements that we've made to fitness tracking. Um, always on heart rate monitoring. Those things that you liked on your Fitbit, but now you can get them in a nicer looking package or in a much more rugged package if you want something that's got that Casio label on it. I mean, if you had your pick, you, you could have like G-Shock with crazy fitness tracking or you could have a Fitbit. I know so, a lot of people who would who would want that Casio man, who would want that G Shock rugged. Let's go, you know, do some push ups and pick a fight, you know, like kind of kind of gear. I don't think Fitbit has that kind of brand awareness. No, I, so, I definitely agree yeah, yeah. on that part. And uh, I've said this time and time again, and I know that um, you know we're talking about futures uh, or different futures here, but in terms of what I want to see, like I miss being able. To like this is my LG G Watch R, um, broken. You know, thanks to the charging pins rotting away. Uh, but, and I, I and I buddy. most missed about it is that you know I was able to um, you know basically play God on my phone uh, without having to touch my phone. And I want right. to be able to one day with the cellular technology play God with leds all around the world or something or like dispense <laughs> you know dispense uh, like a uh, vending machine stuff boom right right there done i paid for it that's that's like that that to me would be the ultimate future for you know smart watches and to be able to you know i, I still no, I, I think it's it's you know i think it still needs the bread and butter of you know health mindedness no. I, I, I totally agree, and that's where I think Wear 2.0 obviously isn't the end of that journey, but man, it, this was a long-awaited step in the right direction. That's, yes. that's what I'm feeling now that I've been using it for, for about three days now. Mm -hmm. What have you been eating in those past three days, by the way? Me? Yes, you <laughs> um, too. You too. You, well, you weren't actually there, Thundery, so... Um... Uh, I was eating scrumptious stuff. Um, I've been um, <laughs> since since I um, tore my meniscus and quad muscle in December. I have not been able to work out, so I've been making a lot of. Uh, you can see it on my Instagram. Green juices, nice. uh, basically, you know, 
you know, kale, some bananas and stuff. So basically, like that. <laughs> nothing that Barcelona could ever, uh, you know, offer you. Juan, what no, you no, think? no, no, not at all. Sadly, no. You didn't hear anything, Juan. You just oh you, no, you, I mean you, like the, the, probiotics the is, is like. We, 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 we go out to Barcelona and Tony and Jaime are all about trying to find like steakhouses and stuff like that. And for me, it was is like, man, I got some <laughs> amazing ceviche. Um, I, I have become my, my sister with her husband. Uh, they they spent a week in Barcelona and they kind of fell in love with the little Boca Dios, those little teeny sort of street vendor sandwiches. And I probably went through about a half dozen of them. Once I found some decent places to walk wow. around and just be like, here's three euro. Give me a tiny little sandwich on the go. And I, you know, like that kind of thing. It's simple and it's good. And it, it's just a unique little um, aspect of uh, of sort of Spanish culture. I had a hard time because I have no ear for Catalan. So to really go exploring, I'm going to need like more time than just hitting the MWC show floor. Because uh, communication was a bit of a problem with my terrible broken Spanish and the fact that they have this sort of cultural history of preserving their own language. Um, there were definitely a lot of language barriers there, but I was eating good. I, I, I had a good time stomping around Barcelona. I mean, our colleague uh, David Rudick of Android Police went up to Montserrat after uh, after the show, and he had the fun time. I was I was ribbing him for for his. Uh, <laughs> well, we were trying to pin habits. we were trying to pin Jaime down on doing the podcast this week while we were still in Barcelona, and we were getting it up to the last day and shooting our wrap up video, and then he was like. Well, I gotta go to Rome. Peace. <laughs> and you're like, no. <laughs> it's like so he's 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 still out there. I, you know, he's he's like, I think his hotel or his Airbnb is like right across the street from the Vatican. You're like, that must be nice. <laughs> good for you, dude. So oh, I think that's as, as good a place as any to wrap this show up. Uh, I'm going to put a put a bow on it now. Um, yeah, before, next, before we'll we see do... you next time at Art Basel. No. <laughs> uh, before before we uh, before we put a pin in it, um, Enabong, what can people expect on the Board at Work channel? I know you guys are wrapping up some videos, probably going to be doing some of the same coverage that we're looking at on some of these phones. But I uh, definitely want to make sure that that conversation is wide because you guys do some killer stuff over at BoardAtWork.com. Thank you very much. Um, this week, you can check out um, a lot of the footage from MWC, mostly Alex. Um, we've you know we covered most of the stuff that. Juan and crew did over there, but not all. And uh, I just put up a video on uh, from Qualcomm talking about Aptex HD, Quick Charge 4.0, as well as also uh, a quick, just a quick snippet on the uh, Snapdragon powered VR headset that does motion tracking. So it actually tracks Ooh. your hands. You don't need a Vive or Oculus. This is just 835 doing that. So that was it's actually pretty cool. Uh, and that will be up on the channel. But you can join me and Juan tomorrow on the weekly, usually at 12 noon. Uh, hopefully we start on time if Google <laughs> Hangouts will let us start on time. Um, and, uh, and then um, I also have another show on my other channel called Onboard, where we do a wrap up of all the comic book TV shows and you know all that fun stuff. So if you like comic books and comic book movies, TV shows, join me on Onboard there, and we can discuss at six p.m. tomorrow as well. I'm gonna Get have to board. avoid that because I'm way behind <laughs> on like Flash and Supergirl, so I can't have you spoiling uh, my TV shows. I'm gonna have do to... you do you watch do you watch Legion? Le oh, I ha no, so I mean, like, and that's another one too. Is like, I, I, I'm, I've got that on my DVR right now, and I need to just binge so that I can catch up. And, and uh, do, do, okay, do you watch spoiled. Expanse? No, I haven't been watching Expanse. Oh, and I've been hearing great things about it, so that's another one. So I mean, dude, I, and like with with uh, like little baby Lex running around and me having to prep for travel, I'm not only stupid far behind, but I just <laughs> caught up on like um, what was the show that I just wrapped on Sci Fi Channel? Uh, the, the, the the one about the creepy pasta, the Candle Cove. Did you watch that? No, no, I, I didn't. Okay, so it's like a six episode arc where they're taking internet creepy pastas and turning them into. TV shows, and the first one they did was on Candle Cove, which is one of my all-time favorite creepy pastas. Oh, so wow. I finally just sat down and watched that, and I and I, I finished the last episode at like four in the morning one night, and then like <laughs> couldn't 
couldn't leave the living room because I had to turn off all the lights in our new place. It was terrifying. <laughs> oh. So, um, so I uh, want to thank you so much for for joining us on the show. Definitely check him out on boardatwork.com, on board the Board at Work YouTube channel, and you can uh, follow him on Twitter at board at work. That's B O O. R-E-D-A-T-W-O-R-K. And there you have it, folks. Another episode of the Pocket Now Weekly has come and gone. This show is over, but the conversation continues on Twitter, where you can find Jules as at Point Jules, and I'm humbly at Some Gadget Guy. Pocket Now is around the web on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Google+, YouTube, and our home site, pocketnow.com. <laughs> We're basically everywhere. Shows like this cannot exist without your support. <clears throat> Sharing the weekly with your friends who love mobile technology and dropping reviews on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and wherever podcast reviews can be left. Uh, once again, we want to thank uh, Mr. Anabong Etta for joining us on this show. And uh, for all of you people out there that uh, normally participate with us on the live chat and on Twitter, we'll be getting back on track as soon as we figure out how to circumvent the the ass hattery which is google hangouts we are working on a good solution we want to make sure that we're providing you guys the highest possible quality show that we can because if it weren't for you listeners and subscribers we wouldn't still be on the air a show that has been broadcasting since 2012 the pocket now weekly will be back next week with all kinds of delicious technology goodness so make sure you tune back in thank you